Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, today we are continuing with the uh, subchapter 93 uh, of our book uh, by Chang and Wainwright. Um, we will be dealing with second order and higher order derivatives and their use in optimization, of course. Uh, what does it mean, uh, the second order derivative? It means the derivative of the derivative. And if you take one more derivative, it is the third order derivative. And it goes on like this, the derivative of the derivative of the derivative. So you have the first order derivative, the second order derivative, the third order derivative, and so on. Uh, for the notation, we can use this one. For the primitive function, we use y equals f of x. The first derivative is dy over dx in the Leibniz notation and f prime of x in Lagrange notation. The second order derivative is d square y over dx square. And this doesn't mean that you are taking the, uh, the difference of x square, but it is dx squared, the square of dx. Because what is d square y over dx square? It is d, the difference of the derivative divided by dx. So uh, we divide twice by dx, it becomes, the denominator becomes dx square. you see? So um, in fact, the difference operator, we use it twice, d of d, which is d square of y, over dx by dx, dx square. Perhaps we should have put a parenthesis uh, at dx uh, to to show that I mean to to underline that it is not the d of x square but dx squared. So uh, in open form, it is d of dy o, uh, over dx by dx, the second derivative. In Lagrange notation, it is f prime of x prime again, so f double prime of x. It is shown like this. For the third derivative, you can put three apostrophes here, three sort of well, well, uh, apostrophes, and then you have f triple prime x. But after the fourth derivative, you use a small uh, well, number over there. So uh, for the functions, the set C means the uh, set of continuous functions. When we say f is an element of C0, you see, we have C, the big case C, with a zero in parentheses as a super, super, superscript. So here, it means F is continuous. F is a member, is an element of the continuous functions. C0 is the set of cont continuous functions. When we denote F is an element of C1, or F belongs to C1, you see, big case letter C, with um, one in parentheses as a superscript, it means the C is the, num the set of continuous functions, and one means once derivable, once differentiable, meaning that its first derivative exists. So when we say F belongs to C1, it means F is continuous, and there is F prime of X. The function has the first derivative, at least. This means, I mean, f belongs to C1, means f is continuous, and there is f prime of x. When we denote f belongs to C2, or f is an element of C2, it means f is continuous, and there is f prime of x and f double prime of x, meaning it has the first derivative and the second derivative. The function is twice differentiable. You can take its first derivative, and you can take also its second derivative, you see? And it goes on like this. When you write f belongs to cn, this means, in fact, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means f is continuous, and it has derivatives up to the nth order. So you can take the derivative of the derivative, the derivative of the derivative, up to the nth derivative of it, uh, of, the, of the function. And to finish, uh, when we denote f belongs to c infinity, which means, uh, I mean, this means f is continuous, 
and differentiable up to infinity. You can take its derivative at any order. It can go, you can differentiate, differentiate and differentiate once more, once more up to infinity. It goes on like this. This is F belongs to C infinity. You see? Great. So, let's see. Example one fx is equal to 4x to the power 4 minus x to the power 3 plus 17x square plus 3x minus 1. So this is a polynomial. Can we differentiate it? Can we take its derivative? Of course, we can take its first derivative. What do, do we do with the polynomials? It's very easy. We just uh, take the power, we put it in front, and if there are some coefficients, we will multiply with this coefficient, and we reduce uh, the power by 1. So, 4 in front of this term, 4 times 4 is 16, x to the power 3. Then, minus x3, uh, just take 3 in front, minus 3, x to the power square, uh, x square, x to the power 2, x square, minus 3x square, plus, well, there is 2 here, just put it in front, 2 times 17 is 34, 34, x to the power, 2 minus 1, 1. And 3x, 3x to the, x is x to the power 1, just put 1 in front, 1 times 3 is 3, and x to the power 0, which is 1, 3 times 1, 3. And minus 1 is constant, its derivative is 0. So, the derivative of this polynomial is the first derivative, 16x to the power 3 minus 3x to the power 2 plus 34x plus 3. Or you can also say 16x cube minus 3x square plus 34x plus 3. Can we differentiate it again? Yes, we can differentiate. We can take its derivative again. So the derivative of the first derivative will be the second derivative of the primitive function of this original polynomial. So what is it? 3 in front, 3 times 16 is 48 x to the power 2, minus 2 times 3 is 6, minus 6x six to the power 1, which is x, 6x, six plus 34x, the derivative is 34, and plus 3, the derivative of 3 is 0, so we obtain as a second derivative of this, um, of the uh, original function, 48x squared minus 6x plus 34. Can we take its third derivative? Of course, we can differentiate this second derivative once more to obtain the third derivative. What is it? 2 times 48 is 96, x minus 6. This is the third derivative, easy. And then the fourth derivative, it is 96 minus 0, which is 96. And the fifth derivative is 0. 96 is a constant, its derivative is 0. And then it continues like this, and in the derivative of 0 is 0, the derivative of 0 is 0. You can differentiate this function up to infinity. So any polynomial is an element of C infinity. Polynomials can be differentiated, meaning that you can take its derivative up to infinity. So here we should note that f prime of x equals 0 is a derivative. When a derivative is equal to 0, it doesn't mean that it has, f has no derivative. Uh, 0 is a number. And f prime x is 0 means uh, it is a derivative, its derivative is 0. The function is, uh, well, it is uh, parallel to the x uh, axis or it, it is parallel to the its domain of definition. And when we say f prime of x0 equals 0, is it's not the same as f prime of x equals 0. f prime of x0 equals 0 means the function is differentiable, it has its first derivative, and the value of its first derivative, which is also a function, at the point x0 is 0. But if the derivative of the function is 0 everywhere, it means that the function is a constant function. These two things are not the same. f prime of x0 equals 0 and f prime of x is 0 is not the same thing. They mean different things. One is the derivative, the derivative function has a value of 0 at the point x0 by chance or by some, some coincidence, whatever, by some reason. But it, it is 0 only there. But if we note f prime x equals 0 everywhere, 
it means that the derivative is zero everywhere, which means the primitive function is a constant function. Those two things are different. All right. So, another example. Here we have a rational function. We have seen a polynomial function. Now we are seeing a rational function as an example. Y is equal to g of x. What is it? x over 1 plus x. Of course, x would be different from minus 1 in order the denominator to not to be 0. So, we can denote this function as y equals x times 1 plus x to the power minus 1 as well. If we want to get rid of the denominator, we can also write it down as x times 1 plus x to the power minus 1. And then differentiate the function. For the primitive function, we can, for taking the first derivative, we can use the um, the formula of the quotient, the derivative of a quotient, or just of the product from here. Here, uh, they use the uh, formula of the, the quotient, uh, of the derivative of a quotient. What is it? The numerator, derivative of the numerator multiplied by the denominator, minus the numerator itself multiplied by the the derivative of the denominator, the whole over denominator square. This is the formula of the quotient derivative of a quotient. So what is it? The derivative of x is 1 multiplied by the numerator, the denominator itself, 1 plus x, 1 times 1 plus x minus the numerator itself, which is x, times the derivative of the denominator, which is 1, the, the derivative of 1 is 0, plus the derivative of x is 1, so the derivative of the denominator is 1. So x times 1 here. 1 times 1 plus x minus x times 1, and the whole over 1 plus x squared, the denominator squared. This is the formula of the quotient uh, derivative. All right, so what is it? 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times x is x, minus x times 1 minus x, plus x and minus x, they annihilate, they cancel each other. We are left with 1 here and at the denominator 1 plus x square, so the whole thing is 1 over 1 plus x square, uh, which can be written as 1 plus x to the power minus 2. And from now on, we can also use the formula of the, uh, of the polynomial, the derivative of the polynomial, but uh, using the uh, chain rule. We should not forget the chain rule, because here we have a composition of functions. Inside the parentheses, we have 1 plus x, and the parentheses is um, to the power minus 2. So, taking the derivative, we should take into consideration that this is a function of a function. So, the chain rule applies here. All right. So, what shall we do? We, should, we shall first take the derivative of the parentheses and multiply it with the, uh, with the derivative of what is inside the parentheses. So minus 2 in front, 1 plus x to the power minus 3, minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3. And the whole multiplied by the derivative of the what is in parentheses. What is it? 1 plus x, the derivative of 1 is 0, plus the derivative of x is 1, so the whole is 1. So we multiply the whole with 1. It doesn't change the result, of course, but in another uh, case, it can change the result. If it is minus 1, for instance, it can change the result. So, uh, we should take into account the chain rule always. We never forget the chain rule. So, the result is the second derivative of the primitive function, x over 1 plus x. It is minus 2 times 1 plus x to the power minus 3 times 1. All right. Minus 2 times 1 plus x to the power minus 3, of course. The third derivative, we just put minus 3 in front, minus 2 times minus 3, uh, the parentheses to the power minus 4, and multiplied with what is uh, the, the derivative of what is inside the parentheses, which is 1. So, all in all, we obtain plus 6 times 1 plus x to the power minus 4. Then the fourth derivative. We put the minus 4 in front and we reduce it by 1. So minus 4 times 6 is tw minus 24. 1 plus x to the power minus 5, minus 4, minus 1, minus 5, times 1. We don't forget this times 1, which is the chain rule. Which come, it comes from the chain rule. Never forget this. All right. 
So what we obtain is minus 4 times 6 is minus 24 times 1 plus x to the power minus 5. So it goes on like this. G is a, an element of C infinity. It is also a continuous function with uh, differentiable up to infinity. If you want a particular value of the second derivative, for instance, we just take the second derivative analytically. And then, for instance, if we want to know its value at x0 equals 2, then, then we replace this x by 2. What, does it, what do we obtain? Minus 2 times 1 plus 2, which is 3, to the power minus 3. Which means um, minus at the power means 1 over. And uh, the third 2 to the power 3 is 8. No, I mean 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 to the power 3 is 27. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 9 is 27. And it is at the denominator. So we obtain minus 2 times 1 over 27, which is minus 2 over 27. This is, is a particular value of this second derivative at x equals 2 or x0 equals 2. This is a particular value. This is the general function and this is the particular value. So all in all, we have to differentiate first as a formula and then replace the particular value if we want a numerical result. Just be careful about it. What is the interpretation of the second derivative? Well, what is, the what is the first derivative first? The first derivative is the limit of delta fx over delta x, meaning the uh, rate of change or rate of variation of the function. We take its limit while uh, delta x goes to 0. This is the definition of the first derivative. So what is the second derivative? It is the the rate of change of the first derivative we take its limit limit of the rate of change of the first derivative when delta x goes to zero again so it is delta of delta fx over delta x square limit of delta square fx over delta x square while delta x goes to zero and here again it is not the delta of x square it is the square of delta x delta x square delta the square of delta x is here if you well if you feel like confounding it you can uh, always put a parenthesis at delta x and then square it what is it in words limit of the rate of change of the rate of change yes of f while the change in x goes to zero this is the wording of the second derivative, limit of the rate of change of the rate of change of f of the function while the change in x goes to zero. You see? So what does it mean? First, let's understand the signs of the first derivative and then the signs of the second derivative. When the function has a first derivative, which is a positive at the point x zero, this means, this is, well, this uh, means, actually, this gives x at the point x equals x0, the function, the primitive function is increasing. It increases. The first derivative shows the slope of the function. When the first derivative is positive, it means the function is increasing. When the first derivative is negative, it means the function is decreasing. So, if at any point x0, at, any, at one point x0, some, some chosen point x0, the first derivative is negative, this means at x equals x0, the function decreases. The function goes down. It decreases. You see? And what is the second derivative? It is the derivative of the first derivative. So, and the first derivative shows the slope of the function. So the second derivative shows the increase or decrease of the slope, whether the slope becomes more positive or more negative. So what does it mean? If the second derivative at x0 is positive, this means at the point x equals x0, f prime x is increasing. The slope of the function increases. The slope is positive, perhaps it's positive. If it is positive, then it is increasing as well. 
The first derivative shows the slope. The second derivative shows the curvature of a function. That the slope increases or decreases. When the second derivative at x0 is negative, it means at the point x equals x0, f prime x decreases. The slope of the function decreases. But what does it mean? Increase or decrease is in algebraic terms. A positive thing increases when it becomes more positive. A positive thing decreases when it becomes less positive and passes to negative. A negative thing increases when it becomes less negative. When it becomes uh, less negative and it, uh, when it goes towards zero. And a negative thing decreases, a negative quantity, a negative concept decreases when it becomes more negative. This in algebraic terms. Don't confound it, don't mm, take it mistakenly, as in everyday language. In everyday language, we speak with absolute values. In the mathematics, we speak with algebraic values, which are positive or negative. All right. So here again, we will study this, these cases more thoroughly and we will understand this algebraic versus absolute value. All right. So we have a, a drawing. Let me pass one uh, page further and show you these pictures, these graphs. This is the figure 9.5 at our book, Shine Gray and Wright, Fort Publishing, page 230. This is uh, the source of this drawing, of this diagram. All right, what is it? We have the x at the x axis at the abscissa, y at the ordinate, so a perfect normal graph. And we have here a, a downward looking parabola, and here an upward looking parabola, meaning the arms are downward uh, looking, and here the uh, arms are upward looking. So here, let's see. We have three points here, A, B, C, and three other points, D, E, F, in the other graph. Let's analyze all these points. At the point A, the slope is positive. You see, the function is increasing. From minus infinity up to x2, the function is increasing. At x1 as well, it is increasing. At the point A, the function is increasing. It has a positive slope. What does it mean in terms of derivative? It means the first derivative of the function at x1 is positive. Then at x2, at the point B, the slope becomes zero. The, um, when we say slope of a function, we mean the slope of the tangent line passing by A. Here the tangent line is passing by B. It is tangent. It just touches at the point B. This tangent, it means this, it touches at one point. So uh, here the tangent line to the function at the point B, which is at the point x2, is uh, has a zero slope, which is the first derivative of the function f uh, at x2 is zero. And here at C, at the point x3, which is the point C here, the slope of the tangent is negative. The function is decreasing. The first derivative of the function at x3 is negative. You see? But what does it mean? y equals fx is the primitive function. Here the slope is positive. It becomes less positive, less positive, less positive, and it becomes zero. And then it becomes negative. And it becomes more and more and more negative. So from positive it decreases to zero, and from zero it decreases to negative and continues decreasing. So all over the all along the function, the first derivative, which is the slope, which shows this the slope of the function, it decreases. So the second derivative is negative all along the function. When we come to this picture, it is the opposite, you see. Here we have at the point D, we have the well the slope of the function of the tangent line is negative. The function is decreasing. The first derivative is negative at point x4 or at point b, the tangent line passing by the 
to point D, tangent to the function at point D is this one. And its slope is negative. You see, the first derivative is negative. Here at the point E, which is the corresponding point of the x5, the tangent line is parallel to the x line, to, to its horizontal. The, the movement stops for a while, for just one, for one moment. And the first derivative at x5 is 0. And then at x6, which corresponds to the point f, the tangent line to the function is um, has a positive slope, which means the first derivative is positive. So what does it mean? Here, the first derivative is negative, and it increases algebraically up to 0. Here at e, it is 0, the first derivative. And then it increases again up to positive, and it becomes more and more positive. So all along the function, the first derivative augments. It increases from negative to 0 to 0 to positive in algebraic terms. So the second derivative of the function is positive all along this, fun this function. You see? So let's go back to one page and see um, all these thoroughly again. This is the this is what I explained. Let's review it and just note that we speak at uh, algebraic terms and not in absolute value terms. At the point A, the first derivative of the function is positive and the second derivative is negative. Here this program um, shifts a little bit these signs as you know. This is an and and sign, the logical and sign sign and it is correct at the presentation. Here this program shifts sometimes as some signs a little bit. Anyway, it's the end. So f prime of at the point a, f prime of x1 is positive and f double prime of x1, the second derivative is negative. Why? The slope is positive but it is decreasing. The function increases at a decreasing rate. The slope is positive and decreasing. What does it mean? The function increase it at a decreasing rate. This positive z is a little erroneous. It should have been s, even in American English. I think it's a, there is a small mistake there. It says the same, but still, I will change it. Anyway, so at the point C, at the point C, which is, let's go back. No, let's go for, forward, this one. At the point C, the slope is negative and it is becoming more negative. So the slope is in decreasing again. The slope decreases at a decreasing rate algebraically, not in absolute terms. It becomes steeper, of course. It becomes steeper, but it becomes more negative. So in algebraic terms, it is decreasing and it, uh, the, the slope is decreasing to, towards more negative. And here, at B and E, the slope is zero. The uh, when well, the first derivative is zero, because the slope of the well, the slope of this the tangent line is parallel to the the tangent line is parallel to the x-axis, uh, meaning that the slope is zero. The first derivative is zero. So all in all, here the function at the point A, the function is increasing but at a decreasing rate towards zero. At here, it is zero, but at a decreasing rate again. And here, the slope is decreasing, but at a decreasing rate again. It decreases and decreases more. Here, it is the opposite. Here, it is decreasing, but it increases towards zero. So the slope is, the function is decreasing at an increasing rate. Here, it is zero. It stops for a, for a one moment, and then it continues increasing the slope and in here it is positive and it is increasing it is increasing and at an increasing rate you see so all in all we are speaking in algebraic terms and not in absolute terms so here you have all these discussion all the all the things we explained you can see them here again Yes, the propositions pertaining to the slope are algebraic. They differ from the everyday language because in everyday language, we speak with absolute values. If something becomes steeper, for us, it increases. But it's not true. 
in algebraic terms, it is not true. Uh, because a negative slope, which is increasing, becomes more flatter. It, it doesn't become uh, steeper, it becomes flatter towards zero. So we should get accustomed to speak algebraically, not in absolute values, as we do in everyday language. This is important. When the derivative is zero, it means the slope is zero, the function stands still for a moment. At the point E and E, we have this situation. But all along the function, here, at the, at the figure uh, A, uh, to the left, we have the uh, second derivative negative. The function is concave. We will learn what this means. And here, at the graph B, the second derivative is positive all along the function. The function is strictly convex. This is strictly concave, and the, at the B, it is strictly convex. And we will learn what this means. The second derivative means uh, shows us the curvature of the function. How it becomes more curved, if you wish. All right. Let's see. Yes, we have gone through all this. So, what is this concavity, convexity business? Curvature. When we say curvature, the slope is the first derivative. It shows the slope of the function, the slope of the tangent line at a point of the, the function. The curvature is how the, becomes, how the function becomes curved, which means concave or convex. Concavity, convexity. A cave, you know what a cave is. It's a kind of, it's like a hole. In a, in a mountain where you can find some some beast, some animal, or you can also um, take some refuge if you don't have any anywhere to 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 hide or to to get refuge, uh, then you can hide in a cave. You can if it rains, you find a cave and you can find there. You can can uh, stand there. You can stay there until the rain stops, for instance. So concave means we are, and there are also the, um, well, the uh, kind of looking glasses, some, some mirrors, concave mirrors and convex mirrors. Concave mirrors show us uh, longer and thinner. Convex mirrors show us uh, shorter and more uh, fatter, round, more round. You have perhaps seen them in, uh, in Luna Park or in some uh, in some supermarkets or in, in um, well in uh, shopping centers. They put these uh, concave and convex mirrors to to amuse people, to entertain people as well. So here in convexity, concavity, we should remember, we should recall that our i is always at minus infinity. We are looking towards the function from minus infinity. It's from uh, meaning we are looking to the function um, downwards up, from down upwards. So, in, for instance, here we have a function. This is the, uh, well, it has remained Turkish, but it is the figure 9.6. At the figure 9.6, I just changed it a little bit. Uh, to make it um, uh, here, it uh, explains the um, risk behavior, but uh, we don't need it for the moment. We need just the uh, the shape of it. And here, the shape is concave. This is figure nine six. So the shape it is the Chiang Gray, right? Our book, the fourth publishing, at page two hundred thirty two. Skip the risk analysis part. We are not uh, responsible of it for this course. You can learn it in your micro courses afterwards. But the shape is interesting because here when we look, when we put our eye at the minus infinity and look upwards, we see the curved, the concave part of the function. This function is strictly concave. And when we put 
uh, at the figure B, at this part B, at the to the right side. When we put our eye to the minus infinity and look upwards, we see the convex. You see the convex parts, the convex uh, curve of the function. So this is concavity. This is convexity. You see, this uh, this is exactly what it means. And in general terms, the mo the most general definition of concavity and convexity. And without, I mean, here we'll explain them for uh, the univariate functions. But these definitions are valid for all dimensions. They are uh, they are free from dimensions. You can use this um, these definitions for uh, any space of any dimensions, any function of any dimension. Here we have x and y. They have a unidimensional function, but you can use these definitions for any dimensions. The, these definitions are so general. So what is strictly concave? Strictly concave is this. Just choose two points, two different points on the function m and n. The part of the portion of the function remaining between m and n is called an arc, like the arc, the ball, to, 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 to throw uh, arrows. And this part is called the um, well, the the half line or the the, the uh, segment between M and N, these two points, is called a chord, like an arrow, like a bow, arc of a bow, and the chord of a bow. You see, to throw arrows, you have certainly done uh, made some bows uh, when you were when you were a child to throw some arrows. So, we can speak of arcs and chords of uh, portions of functions. So, we choose two points, two different points, M and N, meaning that at, at least one of their coordinates are different, is, is different, uh, and they can have all coordinates different as well, no problem, but at least one of their coordinates should be different in order to be different points. When I consider this line segment, any point B, for instance, between M and N, the height of this point should be less than the corresponding point on the function, the point A. Here we have, for instance, uh, X1, X2, and X3, or X0, X1, and X2, as you wish. Or, if you wish, how do you, how does uh, how do they call it? Let's see. Uh, for the strictly concave, which is this shape, for all m n, we should have said uh, m different from n, belonging to the function on the function m and n, belonging to y equals f of x, and for all b, belonging to the segment to the open segment m and n, meaning any point between the M and N on this segment, on this uh, half line, on this uh, portion of line, M and N. Uh, of course, they should not be M or N because they are touching the function anyway. But any of the points between M and N different from M or N, for like B, for instance, uh, the height of this point, the function value of this point, the, the height of this point should be less than the function value of A, which is the corresponding point on the function. So then the Y value. Then, what does it mean? Uh, if this is so, if B, the height of B is less than the height of A, which is um, the point of function corresponding to this X, then uh, f is strictly concave. If b is less than or equal to a, if the height of b is less than or equal to, if it also allow equality, then f is only concave, not strictly concave. If you don't allow uh, equality, then if b is, should be strictly less than a, then uh, f is strictly concave. If b is less than or equal to a, then f is 
only concave. Strictly convex is the opposite of this. It is the uh, mirror sort of uh, picture of it. Uh, for two points, m prime and m prime on the function, we just draw again this chord, this segment, line segment uh, between m prime or m prime. Any point on this segment, the height of any point, the function value, the height of any point should be greater than the corresponding function value a prime, the height of a prime. If this is so, this function is strictly convex. If we allow equality, if b prime, the height of b prime is can be greater or equal to a prime as well, then f is only convex, not strictly convex. Which means we can have linear sort of line portion, line segments on the function. The function is not curved perfectly, but it has some line segments on the function. Uh, our i is at the minus infinity and looks upwards. This we don't forget. And besides, uh, I always explain this thing as a, I mean, as a parabola, as a, um, well, as a, as a picture, I always, uh, or as an example, I always uh, explain this fact with an uh, umbrella. Take a, a perfectly curved umbrella and open it. Open your umbrella and look from downwards or up, from down to upwards in a usual umbrella. If the umbrella is perfectly curved, the, um, well, these uh, small uh, iron or, well, they, yes, they are metal, some small metal um, sticks uh, holding the umbrella, the, uh, the tissue of the umbrella. This is the fabric, the tissue of the umbrella. This tissue of the umbrella is the uh, is the function. These sticks holding the umbrella, the tissue of the umbrella, are these cords, these line segments. You can think them like this. And if the umbrella is perfectly curved, it is strictly concave. The these metal sticks will be will remain under the tissue, under the fabric of the umbrella. And we, if we just turn the umbrella upside down, we have this kind of shape. We have a convex umbrella. If the, uh, the sticks, the iron, iron uh, sort of sticks uh, holding the umbrella are, uh, they remain um, well, higher than the in the upside, in the higher than the tissue of the umbrella, then this umbrella is perfectly convex. If they remain under for all points, besides the points where they are uh, touching the these two points where they are touching this tissue, then the umbrella is perfectly or strictly concave. This one is strictly convex. But if these metal sticks touch the tissue, the fabric of the um, umbrella in, at some points, at some levels, then uh, here the umbrella is concave, but not strictly concave, and here the umbrella can be convex, but not strictly convex. If the function has some linear parts on it, then it is neither strictly concave nor strictly convex. It can be concave or convex, but not strictly, if it has linear portions over it some uh, some lines or some flat uh, surfaces on it. All right, so the first derivative shows the slope. The second derivative shows the curvature. They give us this information. For all x in the domain of definition of the function, if the second derivative is negative, it means it results in this uh, proposition, f is strictly convey, concave. f is strictly concave. If the second derivative is strictly negative, f is strictly concave. This is a unidirectional proposition. I can't say, I can't say if f is strictly concave, then the second derivative should be negative. No. Because 
at, in a strictly concave function, at some point, the second derivative can be zero as, as well. This is possible. That's why this proposition, this logical proposition is unidirectional. If the second derivative is negative, and we don't allow to be equal to zero, perfectly negative, then f is strictly concave. Besides, for all x in the domain of definition of the func function, the second derivative is positive, then f is strictly convex. And this is unidirectional as well. It is the symmetric proposition. Because in a strictly convex function, the second derivative can be zero at some point as well. This is possible, as we will see shortly. That's why these propositions are in a unique sense, in a unique a sort of the, the arrows. They are not if and only if, but if then. It's unidirectional, you see. The other way around doesn't work. Let's see an example. Y equals fx equals x to the power 4. Great. What is the first derivative? Easy. Just take 4 in front and reduce it by 1. 4 x to the power 3. What is the second derivative? 3 by 4, 12 x to the power 2. What is the third derivative? 2 times 12, 24 x to the power 1, 24 x. And this fourth derivative, fourth derivative is 24. And after a fifth derivative and so on, they are 0. So this is a simple polynomial. It's a monomial indeed. All right. So, this uh, second derivative is 12x squared. Besides the point 0, it is positive everywhere. x squared is positive, and 12 times 12 is positive. Positive times positive is positive. There is no doubt that the second derivative of this uh, function is positive everywhere, but at the point x equals 0. At x equals 0, by chance it becomes 0. Otherwise, it is positive everywhere. What does it mean? The function is strictly convex. There is no doubt about it. But at the point x0 equals 0, this second derivative becomes 0. That's why, although this function is strictly convex, we can't say that its second derivative is strictly less than 0. It can be 0 as well by chance, as in this case, the example. But of course, it's not by chance, but it is also the minimum point of the function of this parabola. Uh, well, yes, the second derivative becomes zero and changes sign at the inflection points. Yes, this is also interesting because because um, that the second derivative becomes zero is a sign of an inflection point, but not always. Here, for instance, the minimum point x0 equals uh, 0 is the minimum point of this x to the power 4, uh, y equals x to the power 4. This is a parabola. But in general, the second derivative, when the second derivative becomes 0, we should look at uh, the points around it. If for x less than x0, the second derivative is negative, and for x greater than x0, it becomes positive, for instance, or the inverse. If x less than x0, the second derivative is positive. And after x equals x0, it becomes negative, just being uh, 0 at x equals uh, x0. Then this is, a, this, this is an inflection point. The inflection point is where the function changes its curvature. It, it uh, changes from uh, concave to convex or convex to concave. Let's see. Here we have some uh, drawings. We can see here better. y equals fx equals x to the power 4. This is a parabola. You see? This is this parabola. The first derivative, 4x to the power 3, changes sign. When x is negative, 4x to the power 3 is negative. So the slope is negative. When x is positive, 4x to the power 3, the first derivative is positive. The slope is positive. But all along the curve, all along the function, the second derivative, which is 12x to the x squared, is positive. Where is, isn't it positive? It is just at the x0 equals 0 at the origin. The second derivative, 12x to the power 2, becomes 0. And because this is the minimum point. There is no point below this one. 
So this is a perfectly convex, strictly convex function with a second derivative become, which becomes zero at the x equals zero. Otherwise, it is positive. Here, we see an inflection point, at figure 9.4, at uh, the page 226 of our book. So what is it? You see, here we have a point. This is an inflection point. This point is an inflection point. How can I see it? I can see it by, I don't have to calculate it anything. I can see it. Why? Because here, when I put my eye with the minus infinite and look upwards, then here I see a concavity. And here I see a con convexity. At this very point, the function changes from concave to convex. I already see that this is an inflection point. But I can also uh, analyze it by derivatives because our aim is analyzing functions, isn't it? So at this point, the function is y equals x to the power 3 minus 12x x squared plus 36x plus 8. When I take its derivatives, which we'll, we will take here, I guess. No, not here, but before. Perhaps we have taken it somewhere, haven't we? If not, we can take it. Let's see. I think we have taken the derivative of it somewhere, then, haven't we? Well, we haven't, but we can still, perhaps in an exercise, there is in the exercise, but no, no matter. It's very easy to take the derivatives. So, when I take the derivative of this function, the first derivative is 3x squared minus 24x plus 36, which is a, um, which is a, a second degree polynomial. It has two roots. Uh, the uh, there are portions where the first derivative are positive and there are portions where the first derivative are negative. I can also take the first derivative and make a small table and see a small graph, a small table and see where it is negative and there is this positive. Here from minus infinity up to x equals 2 it is positive and it becomes negative then it becomes positive again. So it makes this S shape or N shape, whatever, S. But here, the first derivative is not the, the, the most interesting, is not the first derivative, it's the second derivative. When I take it again, 3x squared, so 6x, um, here we have um, 6x minus 24, it will be. The second derivative will be 6x, minus um, 24, uh, no, 48, I mean. Mm, yeah, isn't it? 3x squared minus 24x, uh, indeed. Um, yes, uh, then 6x minus 24. The second derivative is 6x minus 24. And 6x minus 24 becomes 0 where, where x equals 4 here. 4 times 6 is 24, minus 24, 0. So the second derivative of this function, when you take the second derivative and put it equal to 0, you solve the x value of this, x0, let's call it, is 4. So, and you can also calculate this y value, which is which is somewhere between 20 and 30, no problem. But for this x equals 4, this second derivative of this function becomes 0. Why does it become zero? Because here, up to four, from minus infinity up to four, the second derivative is always negative. For values less than, for x values less than four, the um, 6x minus 24 is negative. For values greater than four, 6x minus 24 becomes positive. So the up to x zero equals four, the second derivative is negative. After x0 equals 4, from 4 to plus infinity, it is positive. And here at the very point, it is 0. So this is an inflection point. The function changes curvature. It becomes, I mean, it turns to strictly convex, from strictly convex to strictly, from strictly concave to strictly convex. 
up to 4, it is strictly concave. After 4, it is strictly convex. This is an inflection point, you see? All right, all right. And our last slide today, an application with a, um, with a polynomial with a simple parabola. What is it? y equals fx equals ax squared plus bx plus c. a being different from 0, of course. A second degree polynomial, which is a parabola. If a is negative, it will have this shape, an inverse u shape. If a is positive, it will have this u shape. The arms of the parabola will look upwards. If a is negative, it will, they will look downwards, as you know. All right. Do I have to know it? No. I know how to take derivatives, so I can analyze it by their derivatives as well. What is the first derivative of this function? dy over dx is 2ax plus b. And its second derivative, d square y over dx square, is 2a. You see? 2a plus 0, which is 2a. Great. If a is less than 0, if a is negative, d square y over dx square is negative. 2a is negative. What does it mean in terms of curvature of the function? If the second derivative is negative, strictly negative, fx strictly concave, inverse u shape, this shape. And the local, it has a local maximum, which is also a global absolute maximum. If a is positive, it has this shape, how do, do I know it? d square y or dx square, which is the second derivative, is positive. 2a is positive. The second derivative is positive. The function, therefore, the function is strictly convex, u-shape. Then the local or relative minimum, which is here at the point a, x5, it is also the global or absolute minimum, because there is no point below this line. Here, the relative or um, local up, um, maximum a peak point. It is also a global or absolute maximum. And here the local or relative minimum is also a global or absolute minimum. This is a particularity of the parabola. So, uh, this is sufficient for today. Here you have the exercises from the third and fourth publishing of the uh, of our book. Most of them are similar. Some are different a little bit. Just solve them. Uh, look at the solution book and uh, try to solve them first without looking and then look at the answers, look at the solutions. If you don't understand anything, you can always contact me through my phone or my email or uh, WhatsApp, whatever you wish and get prepared for the exam. We have one more week and then we will have the final exam. And the final, for the final exam, I intend to make uh, as an online exam, not as a, uh, as a homework, but as an online exam, so get prepared well. I will explain it afterwards. So thank you for today. Uh, I'm stopping the recording.